I'm not going to get up on this stage. I do a little bit better when I'm wandering around and able to uh, hold a massive phallic symbol up to my face for some reason. Even Thank you. Thank you. Even though I... Well, never mind. I could go off on a whole thing on that. Um, last year, I did do a uh, talk that had lots of flashy graphics, and I did music, soundtrack, and the whole bit. I'm not doing as much of that uh, as I did uh, last year. I'm not doing that much this year. And, uh, well, just a couple of quick things. Uh, about me, I'm with a, uh, affiliated with the group uh, uh, known as NMRC, and that's roughly what you could say the speaking capacity. I'm, that's who I'm speaking as, as an NMRC person, as opposed to my, in the interest of full disclosure, my daytime employer, Buying View. Uh, as you see through, as we go through on some of the slides, some of the images may be somewhat questionable for a, uh, uh, a corporate type talk, so uh, I'm not going to uh, be speaking as that, but I do work for Buying View on the Razor team. Uh, the skills you'll need for this, uh, to be able to understand what's going on in this talk, uh, basically um, what uh, you're going to need to know is hopefully a little bit about computer security, you know what an IP address is, that kind of stuff. I am going to cover some areas that do get somewhat technical, and if you have technical questions that you didn't quite understand that you want to talk to me about later, then feel free to grab me later. Um, I am going to cover a lot of... Uh, uh, social and uh, political uh, related uh, issues as we go through this as well though. And also we're going to have a few, I wouldn't really call them surprises, but just some interesting things that we'll uh, let you know that kind of go along with the entire theme. Oh, and also if there are any questions during this, I must ask one of the question. Uh, it must be in the form of an answer, okay? Because that that really, really simplifies, uh, you know, my, my job here, okay? Uh, first off, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's gone on in the past year. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, DMCA muscle was flexed uh, about a year ago, as it, uh, as it stands. Uh, poor Dimitri was uh, grabbed up after giving a speech. Not exactly after, not right after, they didn't just like pump him in handcuffs as he said thank you or anything but nonetheless it was uh, uh, that muscle was flexed and uh, we saw a little bit of an example of uh, what uh, DMCA was uh, uh, all about for, uh, for whatever it was worth that was kind of a frightening thing for a lot of people simply because of the impl impl implications for security and security research uh, there are a lot of provisions in there uh, that say, okay, researchers are exempt from this or that or the other, but then uh, there's not a lot of clarifications as to exactly what entails research, what entails reverse engineering. So there's some scary things there. Uh, another one was something that absolutely ruined my birthday, which is uh, September 11th, uh, an event that happened that uh, just, just really screwed things up. Um, that has resulted in a whole bunch of emphasis on security. But again, what's happening with our, our, our legislation, our leaders and whatnot, if you want to call them that, the supposed people that are running the, uh, uh, the government, uh, it led them to pass a whole series of what I would call you know, basic Nidra type legislation. Uh, the primary one that I would uh, uh, bring up would be a USA Patriot, okay? Uh, that was a, and I, I hope everyone here saw uh, Jennifer Granick's talk yesterday. Did uh, everyone see that? Okay. Um, that was a very, very uh, 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 good and interesting talk. I was very, uh, uh, very pleased that she did that, and I was uh, somewhat rather frightened. Uh, I know she tried to give a real balanced thing, but I mean, there are some serious uh, uh, implications for some of that. She also talked a little bit about uh, uh, some upcoming laws. The one in particular is the uh, Cybersecurity Enhancement Act. This is the one which basically takes most of your penalties for cyber-related crimes and doubles them. 
and has some interesting provisions so that if you were um, busted on some type of uh, hacking related thing and then you go out and uh, you have like a, a whole lot of elite skills the higher your skill set the higher your sentence uh, is the way I read it and I may be reading it incorrectly but that's how it looks to me more skills involved in doing the attack and then that increases your uh, increases your uh, uh, length of time in with uh, Bubba in a, in a jail cell which is kind of sad other ones that are coming up that are kind of scary, you've got this uh, uh, stuff going on in Europe where they're talking about um, uh, retention of communications, internet communications. Uh, this one's kind of creepy. I can't remember the exact, exact one. This one is really, really, really bad because apparently there are proponents within our government that actually think it's really, really, really good. The premise is this, basically go out there and let's save all communications. That's kind of a vague term, but the, what they're meaning is they're meaning email, they're meaning web, uh, uh, probably something along the lines of instant messaging or whatever, but basically grab that information and then store it so that it's available in case someone needs to go back and do you know, subpoenas and searches and whatnot. This actually is starting, this idea is starting to gain some momentum. Uh, I believe it's the House that has been suggesting, I, I don't know, I don't know the latest on this. The House has been kind of uh, uh, toying with this whole idea. I'll try to speak over the planes as they go over. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, where they want to retain, let's say, all email for 90 days. Okay, now think about that. Copies of all your email retained by your ISP for 90 days. Of course, I would think that most of the ISPs would be extremely pissed off at that because that means they're going to have to have, uh, you know, more storage, more backups, and everything else. Uh, I have a somewhat interesting solution for it would be to, uh, for every one of us that runs a uh, mail server, if this does come into law, for every one of us that runs a mail server, just go in there and open up relaying to go to house.gov and senate.gov and that way they can get all the spam and they can have it and if you want to be really aggressive just bounce all your spam to those systems and then you can just say hey man retain that you motherfuckers you go ahead and just have that okay Now what would of course be interesting is then you start doing your freedom of information requests and say, I want to know all the senators who are getting bestiality porn email. <laughs> well, that's just kind of a fantasy there. <laughs> but anyway, so we, there's bad stuff, okay? There's bad stuff on the way. There are things you can do, and I'll kind of go into that at the end. That's the other thing. I'm trying not to be cynical. I've been talking a lot. This is why, basically, just so you know, I had a whole speech all typed out for this. And I've been wondering, and I've been talking with lots of people uh, here. I see some people here that I've been talking with. Uh, and they say, you know, what are you going to be talking about? And I tell them, and I just, I just threw out all my notes. I took a... I wrote a few down, uh, but uh, I've thrown out all my notes because it's just, everything is changing so fast. Everything is happening so fast, and we have so many uh, odd things going on. Um, the big criticism I had from last year's talk was that, and I heard this from probably the people that have helped put on security conferences on down. They said, this is the security conference uh, this is a hacking conference. Why are you bringing up politics? What does politics have to do with any of this? Uh, someone said everything. It's, that's exactly true. Now, it may not have been true before, but it is true now. There are now extremely serious consequences for your actions. Much more serious than before. Okay? Well, let me give you some examples. Let's take full disclosure, all right, or just the concept of full disclosure. What, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about, let's say you're going to put a post out on, uh, put, 
a post out on bug track. You found a, a vulnerability. You're going to put a post out on vol watch. You, 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 you've got uh, you've, you've got an advisory that's going out. Okay, let's say, uh, did you give the vendor enough time? Okay, that's debatable as to what that amount of time is. Did you give the vendor any time at all? If you didn't give the vendor enough time, there are people that will flame you. Uh, the press will come down on you. There'll be bad things that are, are said about you. Okay, that's one one area. Uh, if you wait too long, it says I notified the vendor. Uh, uh, 35 months ago, and now they're ready to go to the patch. Okay, then you will be. Oh, you waited too long. You left us vulnerable for too long of a time. All right. Uh, if the patch isn't available in a timely fashion, I mean, you, you know, or it's uh, or there's uh, the workarounds don't work. There's all kinds of ramifications that are tied to that. Okay, and it doesn't really. Um, it doesn't really help when you've got uh, various uh, governmental type agencies and various software vendors who seem to be tr you know, trying to work together to at least limit the disclosure itself and using what weaknesses they can find in the whole argument to go ahead and meet their own agenda. Let me give you a very quick example of that that's happening right here at this conference. Um, there's a, uh, a uh, there's a panel. I don't know if it's happened yet or not. I really didn't pay attention to the schedule. Uh, something to do with uh, disclosure, what the feds think. That's today. Okay. Um, what the feds think. Why the hell is Steve Lipner of Microsoft up on a panel telling me what the federal government thinks? That's. I, I really want to know that. I want to know. Someone asked that. I can't go to the talk. I'll. I'll end up in, you know, trying to incite a riot or something. So, but I mean, but that's a very, very telling sign when you think about it. All right, you have a major corporation who's got a vested interest in the control of disclosure, and they're sitting on a panel with, with feds. The same, maybe not the exact feds, but the same federal government that had gone after them previously on antitrust. And they're sitting there and they're saying, this is what we think the policy should be. I, I want to know when the government says we've contacted security experts and uh, industry experts about this kind of stuff, saying uh, we need to come up with a policy on such things as disclosure or on such things as uh, uh, the, some of the various uh, tenets of uh, you know, the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act and whatnot, why they're continually going to such groups as uh, you know, the major software vendors who have uh, you know, the, their interest in it is purely financial in the outcome of that. Someone, someone needs to, uh, well, I guess we are raising that question. Someone go there and ask them that at that, that, that talk. Um, uh, so, uh, another thing with uh, why, why things are critical, but uh, Political, sorry, um, or pitiful, or whatever you want to do. Um, releasing a vulnerability ten years ago really didn't seem to have nearly as much of an impact as it does now. The amount of computers and network devices is rapidly increasing, and it's just a highly accelerated rate. So now, if you release some type of vulnerability information that affects 10% of all systems. 10 years ago, you would have attracted uh, you know, a fair amount of uh, attention, probably nothing mainstream. Now, you're bringing down large corporations who have basically, they're doing that whole B2B thing, and you've got peer-to-peer -peer stuff happening here and there. Uh, you've got intranets, uh, wireless, all kinds of open access points to all kinds of technology, all right? So you, whenever you release vulnerability information, not even necessarily a vul vulnerability code itself, but just details, and then someone writes a worm that goes out there, you're having a massive impact as a result of your actions. And so you have to, uh, uh, you have to rethink this. A, an example would be Code Red, okay? Uh, especially now since the, some of these laws we've been talking about. with. Uh, with Code Red, when it came out, 
uh, you were uh, you were a fuck nut, basically. You know, whoever did that, what a what an idiot. You know, I had to like patch a bunch of servers whose OS I don't even run. Okay, so this this is really sad. Okay, now you're a cyber terrorist. Okay, that's the big difference. Now you can go ahead and say, well, the the exploit code that I wrote that someone adapted into a worm, I it was intended to show people, be able to demonstrate to people that things were vulnerable. Someone will come back and say, I was able to use this in a worm and go and damage all these systems, therefore I got it from you. You are somewhat held accountable, potentially. This is still all unclear. It may not come to that. I hope it doesn't, but it's, it's heading in that direction. Um, if you're planning on doing anything, and I... I don't do this anymore. I haven't done this since uh, USA Patriot, just out of uh, paranoia and nervousness. How many people here scan on the internet? Okay, a few brave people will go ahead and admit they do, even though probably most of you do. Uh, the idea is that, I mean, I do, or I did, as part of research. Okay? It's, it's interesting when you can do fun things like, say, scan the entire address space of China and then look to see how many vulnerable web servers they have, which by the way is uh, pretty much all of them, all right? Um, it, it, it's interesting to do that. It's, it's, and it's wondrous when you find a box to say, I had no idea that a single server could have 14 different CGI vulnerabilities on it, but somehow someone managed to do that. But you can't be going around doing that kind of stuff anymore. You really can't because uh, you might be interpreted as someone performing some type of hostile action. Particularly if we're involved with uh, some type of, when I say we, I mean the United States, uh, are involved with some type of political, diplomatic craziness going on with them. Maybe we're getting ready to go, you know, bomb them in our, you know, our war, on, uh, war on whatever that we're warring on that week. Um, See, basically, I wanted to bring up the point that hacking is political, okay? That's the main thing I wanted to get across to everyone. The other criticism I had from last year was that I gave a lot of theory. Sorry, the um, dangers of having uh, long hair. Um, I gave a lot of theory, but I really didn't point anyone in any particular direction. I just said, things are bad, go get them, you know, and that was, uh, that really didn't help much. Uh, so, because because really, I mean, a technical audience, it's like, okay, it's fine to talk in theory and everything, and, and you know, hopefully most of you are not still drunk enough from the previous night that some of this is, is sinking in. If, it's, if you are still drunk and it's not sinking in, then I can just go up here and just say bullshit and you don't know, and that makes my job easier, but nonetheless, I've got to think that at least some of you are sober. I'm going to propose a problem, okay? And I don't know if you can read the red type. I keep forgetting that uh, I may end up on the roof, even though I do enjoy it. I like, does everyone like the sauna? What's going on? Does everyone like it? Yeah. I, and by the way, that's really uh, the sauna tent thing. That's really Jeff's way of saying, look, all you white, pasty, uh, overweight hackers, we're going to take a couple of pounds off of you because <laughs> DEF CON believes in uh, you know, uh, giving back, making people healthy. Um, in uh, 95, uh, there was a paper written called Programming Satan's Computer. Okay, and in this basically it said, how can you, I'm just summarizing, if I get the summary wrong, you know, to piss on you, I'm trying to make a point. Um, but basically, if, how can you trust the code that you're running if you don't control the underlying operating system itself? Okay? How do you try and, and provide safe code on, a, on a Satan's computer? Uh, the problem that I'll propose today is I call it packeteering Satan's network. Okay? How do we move packets from point A to point B on the internet without private communications and then make sure that uh, Satan, and in this example I'll be using, and, and by the way, 
I'd like to say hello to all of my NSA friends that are here. In this example, I will be using, uh, I'll probably be, for the most part, using the NSA in the role of Satan. And in spite, in spite of the fact that many of you will agree, and uh, you can go ahead and fill in your own uh, uh, evil organization, such as the, uh, uh, the government of the People's Republic of China, uh, or some other repressive re regime, uh, such as that. And, oh, and just while I'm at it, uh, while I'm standing up here, since we do have, I mean, we do have representatives from the uh, U.S. government here, I do want to make clear that I do really think that the U.S. does have a, a pretty good thing going. If I had to pick, and I did actually go through the whole list of countries that signed the WIPO Treaty deciding where I could live and with my MP3s in peace somewhere and couldn't find a country on the planet, I decided, well, I might as well just live here then because I'm already here, and it is pretty good. They pay well here and everything. But to the representatives of the intelligence communities of some of those foreign governments uh, who have been rumored to be here, including people like, uh, uh, you know, Israel and, and, uh, and China and France and whatnot who use a lot of that stuff against their people, fuck you, okay? <laughs> fuck you. All right, let's, let's move on to happier things now. Hold on, let me get a drink. I hope that's a laser pointer. What can Satan sniff? All right. If we're going to be packeteering on Satan's network, what can Satan sniff? I'm not going to read these slides because I hate presentations where you get some bozo up there that has an outline and, and just basically reads the slides to the audience. So uh, these are on the, uh, uh, this presentation is supposed to be on the CD that you got when you uh, signed in, unless, of course, you social engineered your way into DEF CON and didn't pay anything. Uh, basically, this is, uh, and see, that's the other thing that's kind of interesting with this talk. I keep referring to things that are really old, all right? Now think about that. Paper 95, and then I refer to stuff even older than that later on. Um, in uh, 1996, a uh, presentation was made uh, regarding anonymous re remailers by a man named uh, uh, Paul uh, Strassman, National Defense University, and uh, a gentleman named William Marlowe. Uh, who also had some impressive credential of some kind. Anyway, these guys, during the question and answer session of their talk, did mention that uh, our government, and I believe it was the CIA that they possibly referred to, uh, and you can go back, and I put the, in the web addresses of where these uh, posts are, um, you can find out more information on this, did say the CIA is running remailers, okay? Anonymous remailers. You remember that whole anonymous remailer thing that, uh, that uh, hardly anyone uses uh, for various reasons. I think probably just out of laziness, myself included. But nonetheless, they also mentioned that the NSA had successfully developed technology to uh, break crypto below 1,000 bit on the key size and that they themselves personally use at least 1024-bit, okay? Now, that's, that's an interesting thing. Think about that. That's 96 that they made that statement. Of course, once the press found out about the statements that were made at this presentation, uh, uh, everyone denied everything. Everyone denied these questions were even asked and that these answers were even given at that presentation. But nonetheless, you had stuff like that that kind of leaked out. So let's just assume, just for the sake of argument, because we're cautious, paranoid people, okay, that it might possibly be true. Now, moving on. Come on. The heat may be getting to this. Hopefully it won't freeze up, because I got really pretty graphics here. There we go. Hopefully it won't jump ahead another slide. Uh, email from a uh, private email from a former spook. 
Notice some stuff said PGP and basically pretty much every uh, available crypto that's available to us as uh, individuals is breakable. And roughly between that and a few other informal sources that I've heard, uh, uh, anything that's out there can either be broken through some type of brute force or through some type of flaw in the implementation of the crypto itself. Okay? I'm not calling this proof. I'm just letting you know what I heard. Alright? So all I'm doing. And the thing is, is that there's been other times in uh, informal communications with me. I had a very interesting conversation last year with uh, three gentlemen who at the time they said they were NSA. I, now I don't know who they were, but who confirmed some of this type of stuff to me. But of course then they were saying, but of course we could be lying and you'll never know and you'll waste all your time trying to figure out whether we were telling the truth or not. And no one will believe you anyway. So I've heard that. I've heard it from other researchers who I wanted to name their names but they don't want their name associated with this type of information. So let's just say that every once in a while in circles you run into someone who's heard some of the same type of rumors. What are they monitoring? All right, what, let's, let's talk about the types of, and, and, and how are they monitoring? What are the techniques that are used? This is leading up to some points, by the way. So I scare you with they can, they can crack everything. Now let's talk about how they're going to monitor those packets that are flying across the network. You've got uh, basically three types of monitoring. You've got invasive, you've got non-invasive, and then what I'll call stealth. Uh, non-invasive is extremely uh, obvious where the monitoring nodes are. Okay, you're going through a proxy server and it slows to a crawl. Okay, uh, there's a. Uh, it, it's uh, actually I think I skipped a whole slide. This this is uh, should be uh, the uh, invasive one that's up and not the non-invasive. But uh, invasive things slow to a crawl. Very easy to spot the stuff and you can get around. Non-invasive, of course, uh, it's a. There's a, a, a minimal amount of impact to what's going on, okay, but uh, they had to route you around a certain way uh, to make sure that they can sniff traffic. You know, they got to put, you know, you know, maybe you know what I'm talking about. This also has to do with, like, say, you know, cache servers and proxies and whatnot. But, uh, and those, those things are actually fairly easy to avoid. The one that's tough to avoid is the stealth monitoring. And we all know, you know, the, the power of a sniffer. Okay, you put a sniffer in the right place and you're going to get all the traffic. And that's one of the reasons why we do things like we encrypt when we send stuff. And it's fairly hard to avoid. Uh, types of communication. Man, you cannot see the text on that screen in the back, I'm betting. Um, or in the front. In the very front row. Um, Basically, I've up there. There's not much text in these slides, by the way. Just look at the pictures, okay? I'll, uh, and I, I do that on purpose. I, I, because I, I, that's why I, I'm down here so I can see people's reactions and I can know how to roughly adjust as I go along. Um, there's a uh, point-to-point -point communications, such as email. And I think we all, all understand that. Uh, there's also a uh, broadcast. Uh, Usenet is a good example of that. Pressing to a, a news group uh, is a real good example of that type of communication. Uh, you do have the anonymous sender, and that's a type of communication where you're going through one of those remailers that we mentioned earlier where the, uh, the CIA peels off a private copy. And then you have uh, another thing I call uh, uh, traffic pattern masking. And uh, this is like a, a quick example is uh, Loki that uh, came out in, in uh, FRAC. Uh, Google is your friend. Look it up if you're curious. To avoid our stealth monitoring that's going on by Satan, we're going to have to use some stealth communication techniques ourselves. Okay? 
And this stealth communication, that's why basically what we want to be able to use for the sender and the receiver are unknown, or close to being unknown. Uh, that the communication is not going to be particularly obvious. It's going to look like a regular part of traffic. Or if it is obvious, it is so obscured that you're not going to be able to determine what in the hell you're actually looking at. I'm going to talk about several different types of concepts. Some of these are real-world examples and, and adaptations. Uh, I'm going to go through four of them. Uh, one of them I'm going to have someone come up and give me some help on. Uh, but I want to go through and give you some examples. And actually, only one of them I'm actually um, officially writing code on. Uh, but I want to go into a little bit of detail uh, into some of these. And this is where I'm talking about direction. Instead of saying, go get them, here's some things that maybe we can work on as a community all right, that, that uh, might help. And hopefully this doesn't help force some uh, evil uh, legislation down upon us. But nonetheless, maybe we should go ahead and do that anyway and just uh, 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 you know, poke the beast and see what happens. Uh, first one... Digital Dropbox. I, I, does everyone understand what a Dropbox is as far as, you know, that spook spy stuff? You know, you got to get the spot under the bridge. I'm going to hide my package for the other guy. Yeah, it, a dead drop is a good example. Uh, yeah, that's sort of essentially the same, same type of thing. Okay, so I'm talking about a digital version. What would be a good way to do a digital version of this? Um, to give an example of this, um, let me explain uh, a piece of software called Hole Punch. Uh, a colleague I work with at uh, Bindview named Paul Ashton, who I don't know if he's here or not in the room, but if he is, he's probably going to be pissed off because uh, he hasn't released the software yet. It's not, it's not quite ready, but maybe this will help push him along. And send Paul some emails saying, Paul, where the hell is Hole Punch? You know, Simple Nomad told me all about it, said you're getting ready to come out with it any day now. And, um, and uh, maybe he'll get going on it. What Hole Punch does essentially, and this, and if you, this is a, a good idea, good things to think about, is let's say you have a system set up uh, with no ports open. Okay, but you have, you have something running on there, a demon listening, you send in a packet, it's got some, you know, crypto type material in there that's going to identify it as, you know, I'm the one that's going to do this thing, and inside it in the command structure, of course, all this is all encrypted and everything, and you have to be authenticated as you go in there. Uh, it says open up port 22 from this IP address in your built-in uh, IP tables type rules for 60 seconds starting now. Let me see this packet. So it's a really clever way of saying, okay, boom, I'm in, and then, I, you know, with the packet, and then I follow it up with a connection. He's added some extra features in it, including methods of being able to trigger another instance of hole punch to route to yet another system. So if you're out somewhere on the internet, and you can send a package in, in this packet, it can go through a firewall to a box that then goes over and then reboots some system that uh, needs to be rebooted or whatever the command is you need to have done. So it's a cool thing. Hit up Paul, tell him that he needs to get this thing going. And uh, certainly, hopefully, it'll, expi it'll uh, uh, help inspire a few others as well. Steg. Steganography. This is going to be a fun one. I love talking about this stuff. This stuff is cool. And you know who else likes talking about it? The press. The press loves Steg. It's so cool. It's so sexy. Okay, why? Because they don't like to admit it, but because we can talk about porn when we talk about uh, steganography. Uh, and that's the example I'm going to use right now. I'm going to use an example of porn with steganography. I, I'm assuming everyone knows what Steg is. Basically, I take a message and I, I hide it in, the, uh, in, in some of the uh, unused bits in, a, say, a graphic file or a sound file or something. So I can hide a message in there. It's all encrypted and hidden. And to the naked eye or naked ear, depending on what the type of file is, you don't know that there's actually a message in there. Uh, the example I'll give for uh, stealth communications is one that has been theorized, yet it hasn't been proven yet by various uh, um, media outlets. Uh, 
uh, we're going to talk about, uh, like, say, if I was some evil guy wanting to communicate to my minion out there, and I got uh, a copy of that, guess, uh, again, uh, Google is your friend, so you can find out, guess. Um, if I was going to send out a message to uh, all of my evil minion to go do their evil things, such as, uh, you know, you know, it's time we release all the Microsoft source code. You know, it's, uh, you know, whatever the evil thing is, we're going to do. And when you think about it, that would be evil. You know, that would be evil. That would probably such ugly code to look at. I mean, oh my God, that'd be terrible to have to be subjected to that. Yeah. Yeah, the whole thing is in Visual Basic. Yeah, Ted, I, I just, uh, oh my god. Okay, anyway, now this is a comment from someone over there. Yell, yell out encouragements. Thank you. If you can provide jokes, especially in front, I'll pass them on. Um, I, uh, I get some porn, all right? I get a whole some porn. I put my message in the porn, okay? And believe it or not, I've actually done research into this. I know you're shocked, but in the interest of science, in the interest of you, I've gone out and I've collected a shitload of porn. Okay? No, someone asked who's available on the CD. For Christ's sake, we got a room full of hackers. If you guys can't figure out how to get free porn, Anyway, so you go grab your porn, and you put your message in it, you uh, post it to Usenet, and then there's this phenomena that happens, okay, where people grab stuff out of Usenet and then put it on their pay site. Someone else grabs it and puts it on their pay site. And I'm sure no one has ever, no one has ever done this, but there's spots where they've got preview sections on those pay sites, right? Where you can go and get a, a preview of the porn to come. So then all of a sudden, some of your image may start appearing in, in preview type stuff. Now, if you had done some sophisticated research, such as myself, into this phenomenon, you'll notice that there's certain types of porn that have a repost rate that's higher than others, okay? Uh, Asian porn, for example, has an extremely high repost rate. And uh, uh, if, if all you got to do is make sure that your porn ends up being listed on AsianThumbs.org, and it's everywhere. Everywhere. That's all you got to do. Throw away GeoCities thing set up, and bingo, you got your porn everywhere. So that's how you get the message out. And then your evil minion just know to look at, uh, you know, Asian porn being listed on uh, AsianThumbs.org, and bingo, we got the message out. And you'll get it in a timely fashion. It actually is very quick. I've done this. I posted porn on, on Usenet, and it's, uh, you know, in, a, in an Asian news group, and... Uh, Bingo! It's it just within a couple of days. It ends up being on uh, on uh, on Asian thumbs. Interesting. So there you go. You got a distribution method. Uh, for those of you in the uh, audience who are, of course, offended by pornography, and I will address uh, all three of you now. Um, let me give you a different scenario. Okay. Uh, these couple of slides are not in your uh, presentation. But I think you'll find them interesting. Uh, I love this woman. I love her to death. Sandra Bullock. I don't, you can't see this down here at the bottom. Uh, it says uh, desktopwallpapers.net. Okay? Oh, yeah. I, I, love, I love Sandra. So I went out, and this is like a couple of years ago. I downloaded some backgrounds uh, from my computer. Oh, Sandra, let me get another one up. Because I just love her to death. Oh, yeah. There we go. That's the sweet stuff. You, you, well, you, you know, the thing is, is that, she, you know, I, inv I actually sent her an invitation to my birthday party. And she didn't come. It really made me upset because, uh, you know, 
I went to a lot of trouble. I mean, her, you know, her, her name and address were on uh, a, uh, a Bell computer system on an FTP server that was wide open to anonymous access. I just downloaded the data files and looked through there and bingo, found all kinds of people's uh, names and addresses, including Sandra and even Michelle Pfeiffer. And you know what? They didn't even show up after I sent them an invitation directly to their house. I, I can't understand it. But nonetheless, I still care about her, okay? So, uh, yeah, stalker, yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it, 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 I'll, I'm going to try to lump it into research, is what I'm going to do. Uh, it, yeah, I'm, I'm researching stalking techniques on the, uh, on, online. What's interesting about this image was, I was using uh, uh, Nils Provost's uh, uh, Steg Detect and decided you know, I'm looking at all my porn, and like, like him, and I've actually found things I thought might be questionable. I've sent him some of my porn and said, hey, dude, and of course he wasn't bothered at all by it. I don't know why, because, you know, you normally get uh, irritated when people keep sending you an email about stuff and asking you stupid questions about your software, but he seemed to enjoy it okay. He was, he was a good sport. But nonetheless, I didn't find anything in any porn. He hasn't found anything in any porn. Guess what? This image right here? There's steg in it. The one previous too. If you don't believe me, go ahead and download uh, Steg Detect. Go to uh, while it still remains up. Go ahead and go to desktopwallpapers.net. Go find uh, Sandra Bullock in there. Download these images. I believe this one on there is like uh, Sandra Bullock underscore three whatever, and the other ones. This one's. Uh, uh, this is number five, okay? But they're there. Outguess is the one that's detected as being in there, okay? Now, I don't know if you've done a lot of work trying to crack stuff with Steg Break, which is now in included with uh, Steg Detect. I've thrown a, uh, a, a 40 meg dictionary at uh, both of these things. I haven't been able to find uh, out what the passphrase is. Maybe someone else will. I didn't include it in your, it's not included in the CD mainly because for all I know it's got some type of top secret uh, things going on in there. Of course it may just have nothing in it, I don't know. But, but nonetheless, this actually turned up as a hit. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, but we'll just see what, uh, we'll just see what uh, happens. Uh, so as a side project, when you're not scanning your porn for stag, Go ahead and feel free to throw a few uh, CPU cycles at, uh, at uh, Sandra here. Um, now we're going to move on. Let me see if I'm doing on time. Uh, I'm going to have to speed things up. Uh, stealth traffic pattern masking. And the example I'm going to give here is something I'm working on called Masquerade. This is where you take, um, and I, I got the crypto part done. It's now trying to make the thing RFC compliant, which is a pain in the ass. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, uh, by s I'm taking crypto material and I'm shoving it into the header of email. Okay? Uh, the message ID in particular. Shoving it through there, into there, and then um, uh, having it go across that way. And I'm trying to design it to where you have a client that can run on uh, not as root. The stuff gets sniffed and picked up. And I'm trying to add the option of having it fail uh, during the transmission of the email so that it fails in a way to where things don't get logged. It doesn't get logged on an exchange server. It will get logged on, a, uh, on send mail, but it'll look like an error. And so I'm trying to make everything compliant on that. Another idea, throwing stuff into headers. There's been some presentations at both Black Hat and DEF CON that I think they've covered some of this stuff. stuff. Hey, dude, how you doing? Doing good? All right. OK. Um, I'm getting ready to bring someone up here. I want to explain this real quickly. This is something that's interesting, very interesting. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the paper from uh, 86, I believe. Is that correct? think so. Uh, uh, the dining cryptographer's problem. Uh, dining cryptographer's problem is you have three cryptographers. They've gone to a, um, they're going out to a dinner. And again, I'm summarizing quickly. If I get it wrong, sorry. Uh, they want, one of them is going to pay for dinner, but they don't want to know which one of them paid for dinner because they're, I guess, financially shy, at least some of them. But they, 
want to make sure that the NSA didn't pay for dinner because the NSA picking up your dinner that just that's just a, I, apparently a bad thing at least in this paper it was. Um, so they needed to devise a method of being able to communicate between the three of them to ensure that one of them actually paid for dinner. So here's how this is how the solution works, and that is you flip a coin and you look at it, and you only look at it yourself, and then you show it to the person on your right. Okay? You with me so far? I'll, I'll do a quick example at the end. Now what happens is, uh, once the three have done that, and they've shown it to the person on the right, everyone does that, so three people, they've each seen uh, two of the coin tosses. Uh, they notice whether it's heads or tails, and what they're going to do is from the two coin tosses that they saw, they're going to say either same or different. Okay? And they all say it out loud. They say whether it's the two coin tosses were same or different. If you have an odd number of people saying different, because the person that paid for dinner is going to lie. Okay? If you have an odd number of people saying different, then it means that someone at the table paid for dinner. If it's an even amount, it means no one at the table paid for dinner and the NSA must have picked up the tab. The, uh, to, to give you the, uh, the, the real example of, of this is all three of them uh, flip heads. Okay? One of the people lies when it comes time to say same and different. They say different. You got one person that said different. That means that uh, one person at that table paid for dinner. Now, you might be saying, well, oh yeah, well they can, they can determine that it was heads or tails. No, we're just saying same or different. We didn't say, I saw two heads, I saw two tails. Nothing like that. The premise behind the paper, and it goes into a lot more detail, is that you have uh, uh, no way with outside taking the rubber hose and beating people to, determine, to do any type of traffic analysis on this. Now, what's interesting is when you start applying this on a larger scale, let me know when I reach a good spot. Okay. okay. We start applying this on a larger scale because with computers, I can start doing things like, uh, you know, 256 or 512 coin flips at a single time. And when I'm transmitting my coin flips to the person on my right, I can encrypt them, you know, using RSA or, or, or some other thing. Uh, that's referred to as a, a DC net. Sorry, I was distracted. Um, the uh, referred to as a DC net. Uh, some of the scaling issues were addressed in a paper that was not too long ago. Oh, by the way, there's an extension because I know some of you are probably thinking. What if I purposely participate in that uh, dinner and I, even though I didn't pay for dinner, I lie and say that I did? There's a, another paper that came out of, uh, a year or two after that called uh, The Dining Cryptographers at the Disco, uh, which dealing with uh, being interrupted. Now, this, folks, this is stuff from the 80s, okay? This is stuff from the 80s that we're talking about here. Now, uh, somewhat fairly recently, some people at Cornell uh, tried to implement a DC net and ran into some scaling issues and tried to solve it using something called ClickNet. And I advise everyone to do a Google search for ClickNet and, and, and check that out. And that says, if you can't read it in the back, that's uh, C-L-I-Q-U-E net. I Meaning you have small clusters of, you know, let's say seven people or so or five, whatever they put the cutoff point at. And, and some of them are adjoining nodes and then you create this. Now you can do some pretty, uh, Pretty cool things with this. Why don't we? I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up a, a, a friend of mine. His name's uh, Jason Larson. He's worked on the uh, Hogwash project, uh, and uh, he's going to talk to you just briefly. And we'll try to keep this short, but uh, we're probably going to go over anyway. But nonetheless, uh, he's going to talk a little bit about this a little more in detail. Checking for an adapter since he's using a. Uh, actually, that's a pretty nice Mac there. Okay. Well, people in like the first two rows can actually see part of it now. Uh, 
let's think about things that you could put on top of this if you perfect a DC net. Okay? Think about things you could put on top of this. That's going to become really critical when I ask some questions here at the end of the audience instead of you asking questions of me. This is somewhat unrehearsed, okay, folks? So, so bear with this. But I thought it would be fun to get up a couple of people up here besides myself to talk about stuff. It's not working? You want to just go ahead and just talk about it without slides? Yeah. So, can everybody hear me? Okay, how about now? <laughs> okay, simple went over most of it, but uh, basically when you're doing coin flips, that's basically an XOR. So I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with what in crypto and, and uh, what not, but uh, when you start doing uh, coin flips and XORs, um, that's commonly known as a uh, one-time pad. And a one-time pad is theoretically unbreakable. So the, the, uh, the basis of a uh, tiny cryptographer's network is... Uh, yeah, everybody generates a one-time pad, passes it to the guy on the right, and uh, XORs them together. The guy that wants to put in his message also XORs in his message. And then everybody reveals their pads. So when you reveal your pads, everybody XORs the pads together. And since all the pads have been put in twice, they XOR back out. And what you're left with is a message. And since it's mathematically impossible to tell the difference between two pads XOR together and three pads XOR together, it's mathematically impossible to tell who sent the message. So if you really want to give the NSA and the whole line defense or whoever else um, heartburn, then a tiny cryptographer's network is a really good way to, to go about it. There are a couple more cool things you can do with it. So uh, especially in the future, if uh, um, if uh, um, publishing exploits gets to be illegal, then we'll, we're going to need a better system to publish with. So let's say that uh, we have a group of people together, and I want to send a, an exploit to bug track anonymously. And uh, I don't want anybody else to be able to, to play with it. Or let's just say I want to send it to one other person anonymously. Um, a cool side effect of Dining Cryptographer's Networks is that uh, you can exchange one-time pads anonymously, which uh, is basically perfect crypto. Um, the algorithm is pretty simple. All you do is uh, get, get everybody together in a circle and have two people agree to uh, put in messages on the same round. So we take me, Nomad, a couple other people, and we all generate one-time pads, and throw them to the right, and then... Uh, me and whoever I don't, whoever else I don't know, um, sticks in our one-time pads. When you stick in your one-time pad and you XOR everybody's pads together, you get the simple XOR of the two pads back out. Well, since the uh, since both pads are masked by another pad, then it's mathematically impossible to pull out either of the pads because every possibility is equally likely. So, uh, but there are two people that can make sense of the noise. The, the owners of the original two pads because they know the pads. So you can always XO back out your own pad and get the other person's pad. So if we want to uh, um, publish an exploit and uh, we know the NSA or whoever else is listening, then uh, we just get a bunch of people together. We, uh, we exchange pads, um, XO in two pads, throw away one of them, and now I have a pad. I can send a, a message to everybody with impunity because no matter how many CPU cycles they have, no matter how much research they can throw at it, it's mathematically impossible to figure out the message. I just take my new pad, XOR in my exploit, send it over to Nomad, and nobody can break it. So one-time pads can be, or uh, dying cryptographer's rings can be, can be fairly fun if you want to play with them. So another, uh, another method that you can uh, combine with it uh, one of the problems with one-time pads is there's a finite number of participants. Say you only have a, a thousand people um, sitting around together 
exchanging messages, you know, theoretically they can come and knock on a thousand doors and take your computers and life isn't good. So uh, one method to get around that is just to solicit per participants from other countries. So one of the nice things is the NSAs of the world don't usually talk to each other and they don't like people picking on the, um, each other's, uh, each other's uh, citizens. So if you get a few guys from Russia, a few guys from China, then uh, you can be reasonably secure. So uh, actually, that's some slides. OK, thanks, Jason. I want to give Jason a hand. I appreciate that. Uh, We, we can go ahead and stay up here for a bit. We, we concocted this idea, uh, idea. He had pushed for DC Nest, and I was talking about stealth communications at Kansas West. And we had the smallest uh, boff ever at a con, just the two of us talking with paper out. I've got some questions for you guys. We're getting towards the end. I want you to think about some things here. Uh, these are what you call uh, rhetorical or uh, questions without really uh, uh, an answer here. Um, if you do develop unbreakable crypto how long do you think good god I hope they didn't fall in on me uh, how long do you think that that unbreakable crypto is going to remain legal think about it I don't even, I don't even have to speculate on that uh, if you open source perfect crypto and it gets you into trouble. I'm wondering if under the uh, Cybersecurity Enhancement Act, if you could be put in jail for life as uh, aiding and abetting uh, cyber terrorism. I mean, the applications of this are obvious. I mean, you could, uh, you could have dissonance living inside of, uh, uh, you know, oppressed countries being able to get messages out to people and people are able to get messages into them using various combinations of all of these techniques we've been talking about. But uh, if uh, bad guys can use it, and it's unbreakable, and we talked about what they were possibly capable of breaking, if you've got stuff that you can't break, how much trouble are you going to get into? A couple of other things I want to bring up, just while I'm thinking about it. Uh, there's a movement right now to push forward uh, uh, the uh, uh, a government version of, it's kind of like a cyber core. There, if people heard about this? Few people are nodding their heads. CyberCore, you know, there's some kind of government-sponsored program on this. Uh, I want to know: Is it possible for me to form a cyber militia in response to that? Something to ponder. A few people seem to like that one. Uh, I got a question involving free speech for you to think about. Uh, if uh, it's always been questionable whether crypto or code is actually uh, uh, considered free speech. There's been some people say yes, some people say no, various court rulings uh, and, and, and whatnot. Would it make speeches like this illegal if crypto and code uh, is not considered free speech? And also one other question, this one I think there is an answer for. Uh, if I'm busted on any charge, could someone please call Jennifer Granick on my behalf? Just, you know, just in case. Um, that's pretty much all I have. I've gone over on time. Um, I've got one thing I want to do. I need to get a, uh, I need to get one volunteer. Okay, you right here. Come here. See, some of these times a volunteer. There you go. You get a free computer. <laughs> There's your computer. I was told to give one away. That's it? That's it. Go sit down, damn it. <laughs> well, yes, I know. It's uh, made out of uh, fine, uh, fine steel. That's before, uh, before we got really good on it. There's uh, a few shirts here, though, is what I wanted to give away, too, to some of the people here. Uh, this is kind of what... Uh, I consider this talk and everything else this actually to be about, okay? Hacktivism is not defacing web servers. Uh, it, it, that's not what it's about. That doesn't get your message out across to, to anybody in a, in a real positive way. It's trying to do some of the things that we've been talking about here in these directions 
uh, a lot of people out there, like I said, I've done only a very little bit of work myself. A lot of people out there have done this, uh, are, are doing work like this, and it needs to be encouraged. And uh, so we'll just throw one out there for someone to grab. Um, I, I just want to make the point, uh, I was talking with uh, someone from the EFF over at uh, Hard Rock. Uh, there's, a, there's another one out there. Um, I was talking to someone over at the, at the EFF and I was telling them a little bit about my talk and I said, you, you, you're, you're sounding... Asshole. <laughs> you, you, you sound cynical. And I said, well, yeah, I probably do come across as cynical when it comes to this kind of stuff, and I, I don't mean to. I mean, I mean to try to, to be somewhat positive in this and whatnot. And so I was told to pass on this message from uh, the EFF. And by the way, organizations like EFF and Epic uh, uh, really deserve our, our support, and, uh, and they actually deserve a round of applause. They do actually try to do a lot of good for us. How many people here have access to $100? Do you think you could probably get to $100? It would be really interesting if every single DEF CON attendee was able to give the EFF $100. Okay? Because that adds up to like a whole bunch of dollars. All right? I don't know how many attendees. I've heard anywhere from three to 5,000 this year, which is, which is just phenomenal. Uh, Imagine what, the, what can be done with that type of uh, money there. Another thing, and I really do encourage you to do this, it makes a huge difference whether you believe it or not. It really does make a difference. Write a letter with your thoughts. Don't do this in email. Do this by hand. That really gets their attention. Write it out by hand to your congressperson if you've got a problem with one of the laws that is being proposed, or even a law that's passed. Because all those Congress people, they, they're all worried about the people that uh, elected them, and they want to make sure they remain in office. And they've done all kinds of mathematical statistics on the fact that for every one letter, there's a, you know, a thousand people that think this way. Oh my gosh, so I'm going to pay attention to it. Those letters do matter. And if they start coming in volume over some of these things you're concerned about, then we can do something. Now, I know a lot of you would prefer to code. Okay, and I know some of you have probably even never licked a stamp. And let me tell you, don't lick the stamps because they got sticky stuff on the back now and it tastes like shit. But I mean, you know, and, that, and see, I caught some of you saying, yeah, yeah, lick a stamp. He's saying, oh, no, no, they don't do that anymore. That was a long time ago. So you, you've got to you, you, you know, do, do a few things, you know, give, uh, you know, try, try to give back a, a little bit. And uh, I, I think we'll, uh, we'll make a pretty big difference. And that's pretty much... But wait, there's more. They're going to kill me for going over on this. It's just, can you do this in like, like three or four minutes? Yeah, yeah. or maybe two. Uh, one other thing that's going on that I'm, I'm going to have uh, Steve come up here and give you a quick uh, synopsis on yet another uh, uh, little thing that's going on. And he promises to the... Uh, uh, people running the place will be quick. Okay, uh, we announced this at Black Hat, so you know any of you guys that were there probably already know about it. Um, but uh, VulnWatch, uh, in conjunction with Packetstorm, uh, the open source vulnerability database project, um, and a few other open source free information sources have announced kind of a little bit of an alliance. Uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to work together to pool our resources and give a centralized spot. Um, I think probably the uh, key part of the whole thing is we are going to have an open source vulnerability database that everyone can contribute to, everyone can add to it, everyone can access it, everyone can use it. Um, it's going to be completely free, it's not for profit, you know, it'll never be sold, all that kind of fun stuff. That's pretty much it. Uh, the website's isisi.org. Thank you. Because truthfully, information really does want to be free. And when he says free, I mean, if you're a commercial vendor out there, you can grab the data, pull it in, resell it, do whatever you want to do. But the raw source of it's going to be free. Just keep that in mind. Uh, normally, I would take questions on this. And you're probably going to wonder, because uh, I, I, I really don't, a couple things. Uh, DeadDreamers.com for all the graphics was where I, where I, I nabbed them from. Hopefully, I didn't violate any uh, the DMCA by putting them up here in front of you today. Uh, I did give him credit, which is what he asked for, though. Uh, 
to kind of tie this together, uh, the, the last thought that I want to leave you with, okay, and this does, uh, again, we get back to, uh, uh, we get back to a little bit of politics here. Our government, okay, our, our, our government has gone to uh, uh, great lengths to try to protect us, and they do a variety of things in their efforts to try to protect us, and those are appreciated by a lot of us, but sometimes in their effort, they're a little bit overzealous. And we have to keep that kind of stuff in check. Now, you, you currently have a government that is declaring war on concepts. Okay? They're declaring war on concepts. Do, remember the war on drugs? Remember that one? Wow, that was a really good war, wasn't it? Wasn't that successful? What was the what was the big thing? Don't say no. What? Or, or or just say no. That was it. Or yeah, don't say no. There you go. Ooh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just say no. What the hell does that mean? That's like going up to homeless and a homeless person and saying just get a house. You know. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of you know wondrous thinking we got coming from our uh, government. Now we have a war on terrorism. Okay, we're not officially and technically, constitutionally at war with anyone. But we have a, 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 in, in anything else, we're, there's a war on terrorism. Now, with with the uh, the whole rise of these uh, transnational conglomerate corporations that are essentially running everything, and the continued fall of the nation state as things continue to fall down and the borders start disappearing, in large part to technology, okay? The hacker nation, us, we are increasingly becoming subject to an unspoken war, all right? You want to be able to communicate securely from one person to another. You want to be able to do that whether you're talking about recipes for uh, uh, cracking uh, 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 some service running on a system or recipes for cookies. And I'm talking about the kind you eat. Okay? It doesn't matter. If you want that conversation to be private, then it should be. Okay? So I want you all to think about that. If people have got questions, you want to try to grab me later, that's great. Well, I can, I'm not going to take questions now. I went way over and I'm sorry on that. But, uh, there you have it. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you very much. Bless the day.